As we turn to Rikers Island and new revelations in the tragic case of Khalif Browder, who took his own life nearly a year ago, on June 6, 2016, 2015. At the time of his death, Khalif was a 22-year-old New York student who spent three years at Rikers Island Jail without being convicted of a crime. In 2010, when he was just 16, he was sent to Rikers Island without trial on suspicion of stealing a backpack. He spent the next nearly three years at Rikers, even though he was never tried or convicted. For nearly 800 days of that time, he was held in solitary confinement. Khalif always maintained his innocence, requesting a trial, but was only offered plea deals while the trial was repeatedly delayed. Near the end of his time in jail, the judge offered to sentence him to time served if he entered a guilty plea and told him he could face 15 years in prison if he went to trial and was convicted. Khalif still refused to accept the plea deal. He was only released when the case was dismissed. During Khalif Browder's time at Rikers, he struggled with depression and suicidal thoughts stemming from his incarceration. He attempted suicide multiple times. Now, in a new piece for The New Yorker magazine, Jennifer Gonerman details how Khalif actually learned how to commit suicide at Rikers, after seeing another prisoner attempt to take his own life. The piece also details how, before taking his own life, Khalif recounted prison guards goading him on during suicide attempts, saying, quote, if you don't jump, we're going to go in there anyway, so you might as well go ahead and jump, go ahead and jump. These revelations in Khalif Browder's case come amidst increasing scrutiny of the infamous prison, where currently 85 percent of the 10,000 prisoners at Rikers have not yet been tried. On Wednesday, The Intercept reported on the case of Jairo Pastoresa, who has been waiting nearly six years for a trial after having been arrested in 2010. Rikers also made headlines this week for the case of Aitabdel Salam, who spent five months in Rikers because no one told him his bail was only $2. Well, to talk now about Khalif Browder's case and Rikers Island, we're joined once again by Jennifer Gonneman, reporter, author, contributing editor at The New Yorker magazine. She first recounted Khalif Browder's story in a 2014 article called Before the Law, A Boy Was Accused of Taking a Backpack. The courts took the next three years of his life. Jennifer, welcome back to Democracy Now! Explain what you have learned since Khalif's suicide last year. You know, the one-year anniversary of Khalif's suicide is coming up on Monday, which is June 6th. And I was um, <clears throat> planning to write about him and went and tracked down, managed to get three depositions that he gave um, in the last year of his life, which in which he was interviewed by an attorney for New York City um, for hours at a stretch about his time in Rikers. And the last one that was conducted uh, a year ago, May, focused largely on his suicide attempts in, in Rikers. And I didn't actually plan to write any more uh, anything about these depositions, but as I was reading them, I there were a few moments when I almost fell off my chair. I was just so disturbed by some of the revelations that I ended up having to write about it. And we published a story on the New Yorker's website yesterday that that you just summarized. Talk about those revelations. Essentially, I mean, he doesn't use this phrase, but his description of Rikers and his time on Rikers was almost as if it were a school for suicide. You know, he had never attempted suicide before, never really thought about it before. He was arrested. And this is when he was 16. He went into the jail system. And this is the spring of 2010. At, at some point, he sees another uh, young, uh, another adolescent boy in his jail down the cell block with a, a sheet tied around his neck who's just been taken out of his cell. He was, you know, he did not take his life, but he attempted. Um, and so there was almost like a culture of, of, of suicide attempts that he was exposed to, and he started to internalize and think about a lot. And he spent much of his time, as you mentioned, in solitary confinement when he was locked up. 800 days. And, you know, on Rikers, in many places, the only way—so it's, it's a little bit complicated how the, how the sort of world— of, it was just completely upside down, you know, the world of Rikers. And the only way, some, there's sort of perception among officers, among some of the employees, that when a person attempts to harm themselves in solitary, 
that they're only doing it to get out of solitary, to get into general population, to fix their housing situation. So there's sort of this deep skepticism, and that's what you see coming through in the story. You know, obviously, Khalif is, is, is truly depressed and having sort of serious suicidal thoughts, but in that context, things aren't taken seriously, and it's just, you know, this is sort of what happens when we turn our, you know, turn our jails into sort of mental hospitals, almost. I want to turn to Khalif Browder in his own words. This was December 2013, in an interview with HuffPost Live's uh, Mark Lamont Hill. Browder talking about his suicide attempts at Rikers and his efforts to get psychiatric help. I would say I committed suicide about five to six, five or six times. Okay, you attempted suicide five to six times? Yes. While all, in, while, all while still in prison? Yes. Wow. And I, 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 try, I tried to resort to telling the correction officers that I wanted to um, see a psychiatrist or a counselor, something. I was telling them I need mental health because I wasn't feeling right. All, all the stress from my case, everything was just getting to me, and I just, I just couldn't take it. I just needed somebody to talk to. I needed to just let, let, let I just needed to be, I just needed to talk and be stress-free. But the correction officers, they didn't want to hear me out. Nobody wanted to listen. So that was Khalif, um, soon after he was released from prison. And for people who haven't followed Khalif's story, uh, Jennifer Gonerman, you've just done such an amazing job bringing his story to light. Um, explain again how he went to Rikers at the age of 16. Sure. He was walking home from a party late one night in the Bronx, uh, the spring of 2010. He was a sophomore in high school at the time, 16, just about to turn 17. And uh, a police car drives up, and there's somebody in the back seat who points him out and says, you know, points him and said to him and says that this uh, young man and, and another person he was with had uh, robbed him prior, you know, a week or two prior, and accused him of stealing his backpack. And, and, and that set in, in motion a chain of events. Khalif, you know, insisted that he was innocent. Uh, he was taken to the precinct. He, he, he says he was told, well, don't worry about it. We're just going to straighten a few things out, some paperwork. You'll be going home soon. So he thought it was just a sort of routine matter in which he would, you know, be getting home by the morning. And instead, it ended up turning into a three-year odyssey. And he was in this sort of perverse catch-22 situation where, in order to prove his innocence, he had to stay in jail and, as you mentioned, repeatedly refuse the prosecutor's plea offers, because he said, I'm not guilty. I'm not going to plead to something that I didn't do. I want my trial. Where is my right to a trial? And what he didn't understand is that trials barely ever happen in the Bronx and across the country. Almost everybody gets out by pleading to something. But it was his insistence on his innocence and his insistence on not pleading to something that he said he had not done that kept him in jail all that time. And in the Bronx, uh, is notorious for a complete lack of, of sort of speedy trials, and the court delays are outrageous. And that's so it's, you know, dysfunction in the courts, dysfunction in the jail system. He's going back and forth between two of the most dysfunctional systems in New York City, and that's what, what led to him spending so much time locked up. And then there were the beatings, the mm -hmm. horror of mm -hmm. the release of mm -hmm. the video from inside the prison, um, as a guard escorts uh, Khalif to the showers. Um, Khalif appears to speak. Uh, and then the guard suddenly, violently hurls him to the floor as he's already handcuffed. In a separate video from 2010, he's attacked by almost a dozen other teenage prisoners after he punches a gang member who spat in his face. The other prisoners pile on Browder and pummel him until guards intervene. Um, and that first one again, that image of the prison guard, you see him flexing right, his muscles right. uh, before he takes Khalif out, and then he takes him down. You know, the, the craziest thing is, when I met Khalif, um, not long after he got out of jail, he told me about this incident. He said, get the video. And I'm thinking, how am I possibly ever going to get that video? And it, the incident upset him so much, not because it was the worst thing that happened to him on Rikers, but because he, he knew it had happened in full view of the cameras, and there had been no consequences for the officer. And he never got a chance to get any justice in that situation. And ultimately, um, in 2015, we did—The New Yorker did get this video. We did post it on our website. And um, I watched it with Khalif um, the first time he saw it, and it was just unbelievable. It was just unbelievable. And so, uh, as we wrap up, um, talk about this latest piece, Khalif Browder learned how to commit suicide on Rikers. Um, the takeaway, almost a year after mm -hmm. Khalif did mm -hmm. succeed in committing suicide. 
You know, um, <clears throat> this, this piece that just came out on our website yesterday is actually part of a package, and the rest is going to be posted on The New Yorker's website today. We did an audio piece, a radio piece that'll be airing on The New Yorker Radio Hour, radio hour which is on NPR this weekend, also on our website today. And then you can hear Khalif talk about what it was like to be in solitary in his own words, and this is using interview tapes that I conducted with him um, back in 2014, and we also put together a video montage. You know, he's gotten a lot of attention in the in the months and the years since his death, but it doesn't detract from the fact that this was, you know, a straight-up American tragedy that never should have happened. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there have been some reform efforts on Rikers uh, around the country. Obama cited Khalif when he talked about reducing the use of solitary in federal prisons, um, and there's been a number of other initiatives. But I think a year later, <clears throat> You know, as the attention has waned and time has gone on, there's also been a lack of urgency about these same issues. And I thank you, Amy, for, you know, keeping his story alive here on Democracy Now! And thank you, Jennifer Gunnerman, staff writer for The New Yorker magazine. We will link to her piece, headlined, Khalif Browder Learned How to Commit Suicide on Rikers.